I woke up one morning, made it to the station, I heard a strange whistle. It sounded like... Are you still going on about that story, North? Flying Scotsman inquired. Of course I am, Cock of the North replied. Problem is, I never get to finish it. Rather awkward thing, this. Not as awkward as City of Truro is right now, joked Princess Elizabeth. City of Truro was having maintenance done on his smoke box. I'll never get used to being all back to front like this, he moaned. Look, lads, St. Paul's announced. Sir Brian Stanley's coming this way. Perhaps now we can ask him. Sure enough, Sir Brian Stanley and a group of other gentlemen were making their way through the locomotive facility. Flying Scotsman spoke up. Good morning, Sir Stanley, he said. Busy day today. Good morning, Flying Scotsman, Sir Brian Stanley replied. Quite busy indeed. We're rounding out the list for Branco's third summer of rail tours. Oh, very good, sir. But we were wondering, Flying Scotsman continued. Some of us had been stored in this facility ever since our rail tours ended, almost two years ago for some, and, well... What he's trying to say, Princess Elizabeth interrupted, is when can we expect to go home? Sir Brian Stanley paused. I understand your concerns, he said finally, but some of you still need further assessment before you can be returned to your respective railways, museums and such. But I've already been fully assessed, sir, Alden Hall said. And me as well, said Earl of Barclay. Same here, darling, added 611. Yeah, boss, what gives? thundered Big Boy. You will all be returned in good time, Sir Brian Stanley announced firmly. Now, if you'll excuse me, I must be on my way. The engines had no choice but to be content as Sir Brian Stanley walked away. But he hadn't walked too far before he heard an engine call for him. Excuse me, sir, said the voice. But would any of these rail tours be headed to the island of Sodor by chance? Why, yes, they would, said Sir Brian Stanley. They call at a town called Knapford. Oh, that's wonderful, sir, the engine said. But since you're only a tank engine, he continued, you'll need some help pulling your train. No problem, sir, the engine reassured. I've got friends here who can pull with me. Splendid, said Sir Brian Stanley. I'll get it arranged. Um, remind me, what was your name again? Stepney, sir. Stepney the Bluebell Engine. Controllers Railway were very excited. The first of the summer rail tours pulled by Stepney was due to arrive at any minute. Percy and Douglas were remembering when he first came to Sodor many years ago. It will be great to see how Stepney's been getting on, said Percy. I know, replied Douglas. Hopefully since then he hasn't run off with any more cricket balls. Toby chuffed up. I just hope the journey isn't too much for him, he said. Sodor's a long way away from where he lives on the mainland. Perhaps one of his bluebell mates could lend him a wheel, thought Douglas. Just then, the engines heard a chorus of whistles in the distance. They were surprised to see not one, but two trains pull into the station. They were 
towed by Stepney, along with three other engines. Hello everyone, Stepney called out. The rail to a manager said there were so many passengers that we needed to take two trains. So some of my Bluebell Railway friends came to help me out. Meet Adams, Bluebell and Primrose. Guess I wasn't eight, chuckled Douglas. Soon everyone came to see Stepney and his friends. They wanted to know all about the happenings on at the Bluebell Railway. And we've had plenty of events and special visitors, Stepney was explaining. Nothing like on soda, of course, but I'd say successful enough for Heritage Line. And we've heard so much about you all, said Adams. Why, when he came back after his first visit, he couldn't stop talking about his adventures. It is fortunate you were able to come back, said Thomas. Indeed, replied Duck. We've missed you dearly. Bluebell and Primrose were getting bored. Stepney, asked Bluebell, can you show us where you found that cricket ball? Or the hill where you pulled that train with Duck? added Primrose. Be patient, you two, said Adam sternly. We'll be able to see all that in good time. But we're bored, Adams, the two tank engines winced. Adams made a face. Oh, I don't know. Honestly, you two pull a loaded passenger train all across the whole of England, and you're not even so much as winded. We're not as lazy as you are, said Primrose cheekily. Adam spluttered at this. Thompson Duck couldn't help but laugh. All right, you two, called Stepney. Leave poor Adams alone. Bluebell and Primrose had to be content. The next morning, the four Bluebell engines simmered happily in the yard. The rail to a manager had invited enthusiasts to take their photographs. The engines didn't mind, they were used to it. But Bluebell and Primrose were quickly becoming anxious. Stepney, can't we go and explore the island now? Bluebell asked. We've been in this yard for ages, moaned Primrose. We have to wait for the rail to a manager to okay it first, said Stepney. Besides, remarked Adams, you'd never been here before. Suppose you two were to get lost. We wouldn't get lost, Primrose scoffed. Stepney's stories gave us plenty of description. I wouldn't depend on that alone. The rail to a manager came up, having overheard their conversation. I know you two are excited, he said, but Stepney and Adams must go with you when you explore the island. Yes, sir, the tank engine sighed. Just then, Edward pulled up. Stepney, he said, I'm off to the docks. Would you and your friends like to come with me? Please, asked Bluebird and Primrose together. That sounds like a splendid idea, said the rail tour manager. He turned to the twins. But remember what I said, you two. Stay with Stepney and Adams. The engines were off the way and soon arrived at the docks. Edward, Stepney and Adams talked with old friends while Bluebell and Primrose examined their new surroundings. But soon... The two became bored again. Psst, Bluebell, whispered Primrose. Let's sneak away. But the rail to a manager told us not to go without Stepney and Adams, Bluebell protested. Oh, we won't be gone for long, Primrose insisted. Besides, we'll never see the whole of Soda with them chatting about. You're right, said Bluebell. Let's slip away. So they both quietly puffed out of the docks without anyone noticing. Stepney then looked up. Adams, he said, where the twins got to? What do you mean, they're right here? 
The engines looked in horror to see that neither Bluebell or Primrose were anywhere. They must have slipped away when we weren't looking, said Edward. But where could they have got to? asked Stepney. If you chatty engines were paying attention, Cranky grumbled above them, you'd see that they ran off that way. Right, Edward announced. Adams, you head that way to see if you can find them. Stepney and I will go back to Knapford to tell the Fat Controller. And the engine set off. Meanwhile, Bluebell and Primrose were having a wonderful time. They raced around the island, taking in the surroundings. But soon, the two engines found themselves in the scrapyard. This place is scary, Primrose shivered. We should probably go back, Bluebell suggested. But there was trouble. The two engines had puffed around so much that they ran out of water and couldn't move. They were stuck where they sat. Now what are we going to do? Bluebell winced. I'm sure Stepney and Adams will help us, said Primrose. But they don't know where we are, Bluebell cried. Oh, we shouldn't have run off. Then, Arian Burton emerged from the smelting shed. Well, look what we have here, Bert, growled Ari. A couple of steamies prime for scrapping, joked Bert. Help, called the twins. These engines are for scrapping, called a voice. Edward, Stepney and Adams rolled into the scrapyard. Leave these engines alone, yelled Stepney. All right, all right, said Bert. We weren't really going to scrap this lot. We was only having a laugh, weren't we? Sniffed Harry. Come on, you two, said Edward, as he coupled up to the twins. That's enough excitement for you today. Yes, Edward, they whimpered. I'm ashamed of you, the rail tour manager scolded. I told you not to go wandering off without Stepney or Adams. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir, the two engines said mournfully. And we should have kept a better eye on you, Stepney admitted. Yes said Adams. We shouldn't have gotten so distracted. We've all made mistakes today, said Edward. But, the Fat Controller added, the important thing is that you're all safe and accounted for. All the engines agreed. The next day, everyone came to say goodbye to Stepney and the Bluebell engines. We shall miss you, the Fat Controller said. Come back and see us soon, said the engines. And you are always welcome on the Bluebell Railway, said Stepney. Then the guard's whistle blew, and the Bluebell Railway engines puffed for home. to depart with a goods train when a new rail tour glided into Nanford. Henry was delighted to see the visitor. Hello, he said. I'm Henry. Are you here for a rail tour? Yes, I am, said the engine. My name is Butler Henderson. It's very nice to meet you. Just then, Henry's guard blew his whistle. 
Sorry, said Henry, that's my guard. I must be off. We'll have to talk later. And Henry puffed away with his trucks clattering behind. As Butler Henderson waited for the points to change to go into the yard, he saw a passenger approach the rail to a manager. Excuse me, the passenger said. Are you the manager for this rail tour? Yes, I am, he responded. What seems to be the issue? I'm sorry to inform you, the passenger explained, as I overheard one of your staff saying some rather rude things about another passenger. The rail tour manager frowned. Thank you for letting me know, he said. We take these situations very seriously. If you could follow me to the guard's compartment, we can file a report. Thank you, the visitor said as they went to the brake coach. I just don't know what could cause such bigotry. Butler Henderson was confused. Bigotry, he said to himself. What could that mean? Later, Butler Henderson was still lost in thought, pondering what the passenger was talking about. Could that passenger be talking about a rather large tree? He said to himself. That sounds right. A big tree on this island must be causing people to become rude. Now, where could it be? I'm sure I passed it before I came to the station. Just then, Henry pulled up. Butler Henderson, he said. Whatever's the matter? Ah, Henry, said Butler Henderson. Perhaps you could help me. Help you? With what? Well, he explained, I've just learned of a big tree that makes people become rude to others. Henry stared. You can't be serious. But I am, Butler Henderson went on. A passenger told the rail to a manager that a staff member was being rude to someone because of a big tree. Henry was trying to make sense of all this. I'm sure they were talking about something else, he said. But it's true, Butler Henderson pleaded. You must know something about a big tree here. Henry sighed. All right, he huffed. I'll help you find this big tree you're talking about. Thank you, Butler Henderson cheered. Soon, the two engines puffed around the island looking for a big tree. They retraced Butler Henderson's route to Napford. They just came near a wooden area near the line when... Stop! Butler Henderson called out. What's the matter? puffed Henry. There it is! That's it! The big tree! I'm sure of it! Sure enough, not too far from the track stood a very big tree. There's trees like that all over the island, Henry protested. How could you know that this was the one? I passed it before I came to the station, Butler Henderson said. Now, how could this tree cause someone to become rude? Henry was beginning to get cross. Don't be silly, he said. How can a tree cause someone to be rude? Perhaps it's magic. Stuff and nonsense, huffed Henry. There's no such thing as a magic tree. I should know. Well, it's making you very rude, I can tell you that, Butler Henderson scoffed. So it must be working. Suddenly, both engines heard a whistle. It was Gordon with the express. As soon as he saw Butler Henderson on the line in front of him, he put on his brakes. But he couldn't stop in time and biffed into Butler Henderson's buffers. Ouch! he said as Gordon came to a stop. Gordon was very cross. What are you doing on my line, you silly engine? He fumed. Well, I, um, Butler Henderson stammered. We were looking for a big magic tree, Henry interrupted. Silly, huffed Gordon. There's no such thing as a magic tree. Now get out of my way before you make me late. Sorry, Gordon, both engines said and they backed away so Gordon could proceed to Napford. When the three engines made their way back to the station, both the Fat Controller and the Rail Tour Manager spoke to Butler Henderson. What were you doing in the middle of the main line? The Rail Tour Manager asked. I heard what that passenger told you about the big tree that caused the staff member to be rude, Butler Henderson explained, so I thought I'd try to find it. The rail tour manager stared. Do you mean bigotry? 
Yes, that's what the passenger said. No, Butler Henderson, the rail tour manager corrected. It's not a big tree. It's bigger tree. Butler Henderson was confused. What does that mean? Bigotry is when someone is intolerant of others, he explained. In the passenger's case, the staff member was making rude remarks about someone else on the train. I've made sure to take care of it personally, and I can tell you a big tree had nothing to do with it. Butler Henderson now felt silly. I'm sorry, sir, he said. I just wanted to help and make sure it never happens again. Well, said the fat controller, looking around for a big tree isn't the way. The only way to stop bigotry is to be accepting of others. Butler Henderson agreed. The next day, Butler Henderson was ready to depart for the mainland. Henry and Gordon came to see him off. I'm sorry I took you on a fool's errand, Henry, Butler Henderson said. It's all right, said Henry. You had good intentions for doing it. Just try not to get in the way of express trains, Gordon cautioned, and they all had a good laugh as Butler Henderson left the station. As for the rude staff member, well, he did make it home to the mainland eventually, on a different train two days later. Derek is a diesel who mainly works on Edward's branch line. He means well and wants to be really useful. But when he first arrived on the island, he was plagued with teething troubles and would break down constantly. If you hear Derek talk nowadays, he would say that the Fat Controller is a miracle worker. Because when he was sent to the works, they rebuilt his engine and mended all his issues. Now Derek is as useful as ever and has never had teething trouble since. One day, Derek had just arrived at Knapford with some trucks of stone when a new rail to the train arrived. engine pulling it was a large green diesel. Derek was impressed. He went up to say hello. Hello, he said. I'm Derek. Who are you? Hey there, Chuck, said the diesel. King's on Yorkshire Light Inventory reporting for duty. My name isn't Chuck, though. It's Derek. Just a term of endearment, that is, the visitor responded. I'm here for one of them rare tour things. Just then, Bill and Ben arrived with their own line of stone trucks. Oh look, Bill, said Ben. We've got a new rail tour on the island. I can see that, hissed Bill. I'm not blind, you know. The twins then noticed Derek. I should warn you, Mr... Um... Uh, King's on Yorkshire Light Infantry. Mr. King's, Bill continued. That, that engine over there has terrible teething troubles. Oh, yes, agreed Ben, constantly breaking down due to a faulty cooling system. Not his fault, surely, but it causes havoc for the rest of us. That's not true, Derek protested. I haven't had a breakdown in ages. Besides, the Fat Controller fixed all that years ago. Never say never, Derek, laughed Ben, and the two naughty engines chuffed away laughing to themselves. Ignore them, kings. Derek huffed. Those two are always teasing. Take no notice, Kings reassured. I'm sure you'll show them. The next day, a large stone delivery was needed at the docks. Derek had just delivered his first load and was on his way to the quarry for more. Suddenly, he heard a terrible clunking sound coming from his engine. 
Then he felt a terrible pain. His engine clunked and sputtered as he ground to a halt. Kings was in the yard when the rescue call came, and he offered to rescue Derek. Ah, sir, said Kings as he buffered up. What happened? Driver said my camshaft is cracked, said Derek feebly. Oh, I've never had this happen before. Come now, said Kings. Who could happen to anyone? I'll take you to the works. Thank you, but what about my stone deliveries? I suppose I can do that too. Better than staying put in that yard all day. So Kings pulled Derek to the works, then hurried back to the quarry to fetch the stone trucks. Ben and Ben were about to head off with their trucks when he arrived. Hey, it's you again, said Bill cheekily. Where's Derek got to? Poor Derek's at the works, Kings explained. I'm filling in for him. We were right, chuckled Ben. His teething troubles are back for sure. That's quite enough of that, King said sternly. At least he was being useful, instead of mucking about all day telling jokes. The twins seethed at this. Kings was soon coupled to the trucks and was ready to go. Kings, said his driver, when was the last time you refueled? I topped up this morning, didn't I? King said. I should still have plenty for this job. I'd say you should refuel now before anything bad happens. The job's too important for that, King said. Come now, Derek's counting on me. The driver reluctantly agreed. Kings was sure he was right. But he wasn't. He had just switched on to the main line when suddenly he stopped and his powerful engine shut down. What's happened? he said. You've run out of fuel, said his driver, rather annoyed. I told you to refuel back at the quarry. Now we're too far away from the quarry's pumps. Kings felt ashamed. But, as luck would have it, Derek came up, newly repaired from the works. Hello, Kings, he said cheerfully. The works put a new camshaft in record time. Have you gotten along well with the stone trucks? I wish I could say I did, King said regretfully. I was about to set off when I ran out of fuel. I could take it then, said Derek, and get you refueled at the docks. Kings wasn't so sure. I'm a heavy engine, he warned. It might be too much for you to pull. I'm sure it'll be fine. Besides, I've taken heavier loads than this. So Derek was coupled in front of Kings. He pulled and pulled as hard as he could. His engines roared and the train slowly began to move. Come on, come on, King shouted. I'm doing it, I'm doing it, Derek huffed. Soon he was moving along, slowly but surely, down the line with the trucks. Kings cheered him on the whole way. Here comes the diesel train with its steel refrain, hear me knocking. The diesel's on its way, it's gonna win the day, hear me knocking. Listen to the chatter of the diesel force, generating 2700 horse. Camshaft rolling while the rockers rock. Bill and Ben were already at the docks delivering their stone when, tired but triumphant, Derek pulled into the yard with Kings and the stone trucks behind him. You've done it, lad! Kings cheered and honked his horn loudly. 
Bill and Ben were amazed. You pulled that big diesel and the trucks all by yourself? They gasped. Yes, I did, Deck panted happily, without even so much as a splutter. Kings were soon refueled and pushed Derek all the way back to Napkin. The next morning, King's rail tour train was ready to head back to the mainland. Derek had come to see him off. Thanks for helping me yesterday, King said. You be sure not to let no one fool you. You're a mighty engine indeed. Thank you, said Derek, and be sure to mind your fuel gauge. And when the guard blew his whistle, King's was off for home. Gordon was boasting to the others. Do you all remember when the Queen came to the island? He asked. I remember it like it was yesterday. The station was decorated, flags were waving, crowds were cheering. Yes, Gordon, remarked Edward. We know, we were all there too. And I looked as grand as ever, Gordon continued pulling the royal train into the station. My brass shone like gold, and my paint was gleaming. Hmph, sniffed Henry. It should have been me pulling that train. I was the fat controller's first choice, after all. But you had to go and spill a paint pot all over yourself, laughed James. Henry groaned in anger. I wonder if the Queen will ever come back, said Thomas. She did seem to like our railway. I suppose the Fat Controller would have to invite her again, suggested Edward, but we'll just have to wait and see. The engines were soon off to work. Thomas was shunting trucks in the yard when a new rail to a train pulled into the station. Thomas stared at the visitor. He had blue and silver paint that seemed to gleam in the sunlight. Then Thomas noticed his tender. It had the royal coat of arms. Cinders and ashes, he cried. It must be a royal train. The Queen's come back. I must tell the others. And Thomas rushed out of the yard. The visitor stared. I wonder where he's off to, he said to himself. Thomas found Gordon up the line. Gordon, he shouted. The Queen's on the island. Silly, huffed Gordon. How could she? The Fat Controller would have towed us. But she is, Thomas pleaded. There's a rail to her at Knapford, and the engine has the royal coat of arms on his tender. Gordon was shocked. I can't believe it. The Fat Controller should have asked me to pull the royal train. Never mind that, Thomas huffed. We have to tell everyone and get the island ready. Right, said Gordon. The two engines set off to tell the others about the Queen's arrival. Meanwhile, the visiting engine, whose name is Hudson, waited in the yard and watched the engines race up and down the line. This railway seems busy today, he said to himself. What could be happening? Percy then raced into the yard. Hey, you there, Hudson called out. Slow down a minute. Percy skidded to a halt. Hello, 
he panted. You're a rail to engine, right? That's right. I'm Hudson. And I'm Percy. I can't stay for too long. I have to make sure everything is ready. What for? asked Hudson. What's going on? Didn't you know? said Percy. The Queen is here. Hudson was shocked. The Queen's here? he shouted. I didn't even know. I've got to get prepared to meet Her Majesty. And he puffed out of the yard. The rail tour manager ran up. Hudson, where are you going? I can't stop the talk, sir, Hudson puffed. The Queen is here. What are you talking about? No, she isn't. But Hudson didn't hear him and he backed out of the yard. But he didn't see that James was coming from the other way with a truck of paint drums. Look out! He shouted. But it was too late. Hudson's tender smashed into James's truck. Drums of paint flew everywhere and littered the line. Hudson felt ashamed. Soon, Percy brought the breakdown train to clear away the mess. The fat controller and the rail tour manager spoke to Hudson. What were you playing at, Hudson? The rail tour manager said, running about the yard like that, thinking the Queen is here. I'm sorry, sir, Hudson whimpered. It's just that Percy told me she was coming. The fat controller turned to the little green engine. Percy, he inquired, do you have anything to say about this? Well, sir, Percy began, Thomas was the one who told me that she was coming. That's strange, James added. Gordon told me the same thing. The fat controller stared. Whatever those two playing at. As if by chance, Thomas and Gordon arrived. Shomish and Gordon, the fat controller scolded. Why have you been spreading lies about the Queen visiting? We haven't lied, sir, pleaded Gordon. That engine has the coat of arms on his tender, sir, explained Thomas. Why else would he wear it if the Queen wasn't coming? The fat controller now understood the situation. I think you two might be a bit confused, he said. Unless, said Gordon, it's a different Queen. He looked the visitor up and down. Do they have a Queen in America? I'm not American, said Hudson. I'm Canadian. And yes, Canada does have a queen, Her Majesty Elizabeth II. But that's our queen, said Thomas. How can she be queen of both Canada and the United Kingdom? Because, the fat control explained, Canada has historical charge to the United Kingdom. They were part of the British Empire. And when they decided to become an independent country, added the rail to a manager, they formed their own government, but kept the Queen as their head of state, like a figurehead. That's right, said Hudson. I even pulled the royal train when George VI visited. Thomas and Gordon now felt silly. We're sorry, sirs, they said. That settled then, said the fat controller. But I suppose you two can help clear away this mesh. The accident was soon cleared away, and things were turned to normal. That night, Hudson was telling the engines all about his royal train. And I traversed my way up the Rocky Mountains, and I didn't stop till I made it to Vancouver, Hudson finished. The engines were amazed. Well, Hudson, said Gordon Grandy, that's all well and good, but let me tell you how a royal train should be pulled. The others groaned as Gordon told his royal train story for the umpteenth time. Sildor for their annual summer visit. Spencer, their private engine, had brought them over from the mainland as usual. 
he was very proud of being a privately owned engine and talked endlessly about it. I suppose the best part about it is the responsibility of it all, Spencer boasted to the others. You must always be on call whenever you're needed. The same can be said for any engine, Edward pointed out. Whether you're privately owned or not, the important thing is being really useful. Spencer frowned. I'd expect that sort of response from engines who work in general service, he sniffed. General service? huffed Gordon. At least we're used every day. How many times have you been out on the rails this year? As many times as the Duke and Duchess need me, said Spencer matter-of-factly. So not a lot then, joked Thomas. Spencer groaned. Just then, the engines heard an unfamiliar whistle as a new rail to a train pulled into Knapford. The visitor had a futuristic streamlined design and shining silver. They were amazed. Even Spencer was impressed. Hello, the engine said. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm New York Central Hudson, number 5452, but you can call me Dreyfus. Hello, Dreyfus. I'm Gordon, said the blue engine. You look like an express engine. Oh yes, you're completely right, said Dreyfus. Back in the old days, I was an express engine, pulling expresses. Me and my brothers pulled a wonderful train. It was the greatest. It was the 20th Century Limited. The 20th Century Limited? The engines gasped. That train's famous, remarked Gordon. Dreyfus continued. We'd run from New York City all the way to Chicago and back. It was the greatest train, the greatest ever, believe me. Ask anyone. It was great. I pulled expresses too, said Spencer desperately trying to steer the conversation back to him. But you're not as interesting as Dreyfus, Thomas chuckled. The others laughed. Spencer sulked quietly as Dreyfus continued his stories. It wasn't long before all the engines got to meet Dreyfus. He told them all about his life on the New York Central. What does that engine have that I don't? Spencer huffed to himself that afternoon. I've done all the things that he's done, perhaps more so. It isn't fair. The Duke and Duchess then came to see him. Come along, Spencer, they said. We must be off to the summer house. Yes, your graces, said Spencer. By the way, how was your evening? Oh, it was quite excellent, thank you, said the Duke. Sir Topham Hatt held a marvellous luncheon, and afterwards we got to meet that rail to engine Dreyfus. Spencer winced at this. Y you did, did you? He stuttered. Oh, yes, remarked the Duchess. He's quite the remarkable engine with a colourful history. He reminds me of you somewhat. Spencer was lost for words. Anyway, the Duke said, it's time we were off. Spencer sat forlornly as the Duke and Duchess boarded their coaches. They remind him of me, he kept saying to himself. I'm nothing like him. I'd reckon that I have more excellence in one wheel than he has in his entire body. Dreyfus then slinked into the yard. Don't kid yourself, he smirked. You're nothing like me. You're useless, completely useless. Nothing but a loser, believe me. Everyone says it, everyone believes it. Spencer was furious. In fact, Dreyfus went on, being compared to you should be regarded as an insult. You know why? Because you're fake. You're a fake engine. That does it, Spencer thundered. I'll show you who's fake. Meet me here tomorrow. We'll race round the island. The winner shall prove their worth. I love a challenge, especially when I know that I'll be the winner.
The next morning, the two engines met at Knapford Station. The others came to see the start of it, wondering who would win. Prepared to lose, Dreyfus, Spencer huffed. I am prepared to see it happen to you, Dreyfus smirked. On your marks, called Edward. Get set, go! Edward blew his whistle as the two mighty engines raced out of the station. The engines tore down the line as fast as they could. Dreyfus took the lead, but Spencer soon caught up. They raced through stations and rushed through tunnels. Dreyfus soon took the lead again, leaving Spencer far behind. Mavis was arranging trucks at the quarry when Dreyfus rushed by. Oh my, she said, what a fabulous looking engine. Hearing this, Dreyfus screeched to a stop and backed over to the diesel shunter. Oh, you think I'm fabulous, eh? Dreyfus said. Absolutely, Mavis swooned. You pulled the 20th Century Limited too, right? Yes, I did. Back in the old days, I was an express engine, pulling expresses. Suddenly, Spencer flew by. Dreyfus was surprised. Oh no, the race, he exclaimed, and chased after him. But it was no use. Spencer had won the race as he puffed triumphantly into Knapford. The engines cheered. Well done, Spencer, they said. Dreyfus huffed in moments later. He was very cross. This race was rigged, he shouted. Spencer, you set me up. I want a rematch. What do you mean? asked Edward. That diesel at the quarry distracted me so that Spencer could get ahead, Dreyfus protested. This race was stolen from me, and I demand a rematch. That just sounds like you weren't paying attention, said Thomas. Unless, said Gordon, he looked at Spencer. Do you know anything about this? I have no idea what he's on about, Spencer admitted. That's it then, stated Edward. Spencer won the race, and that's that. No, it isn't, Dreyfus shouted. This race was stolen. Believe me, ask anyone, they'll tell you the same. No, huffed Spencer. You're just a sore loser. The engines laughed, while Dreyfus could do nothing but admit defeat. Did Spencer really fix the race? The engines will tell you he didn't. But if you were to ask the quarry manager, he'd tell you that he swore he saw Spence and Mavis wink to each other as they passed by. Thomas had just shunted Annie and Clarabelle into a siding when a new rail to a train arrived. The coaches bumped and rattled behind the large engine pulling the train. Oh, goodness me, said Annie. What a terrible racket, remarked Clarabelle. I'm sure the passengers will be cross, added Thomas. He was right. As soon as the train arrived at the platform, the passengers swarmed around the rail to a manager, complaining about how bumpy their ride was. Thomas chuckled. I'll see you later. I'm off to collect some trucks. And Thomas puffed happily away. Annie and Clarabelle watched from their siding as the rail to a manager spoke to the large engine. Garrett, he said sternly, our passengers have complained about how roughly you handle the coaches. I don't know how many times we've been over this. 
I'm sorry, sir, said Garrett. I do try to pull them smoothly, but I get so nervous. You must try not to get nervous again, said the rail tour manager. Otherwise, I may have to arrange for someone else to take the rail tour back home. Garrett rolled sadly into the yard beside Annie and Clarabelle. The two coaches decided to cheer him up. Hello, they said warmly. I'm Annie, and I'm Clarabelle. Who are you? Hello, said the engine mournfully. I'm Garrett. We overheard what the rail tour manager said, said Annie. Have you ever pulled coaches before? asked Clarabelle. I mostly pulled goods trains, Garrett explained. I did pull coaches once, but it was a very long time ago. I want to be useful and pull them smoothly, but I get so nervous about whether I'm doing it right that I end up bumping them about. Perhaps you're just in need of some practice, suggested Clarabelle. Why don't we try to help you? asked Annie. Would you? Really? said Garrett. Of course, replied the coaches. This is your rail tour. We'd hate to see you being replaced for the homeward journey. So Garrett was coupled to the coaches. He was nearly ready to start when Thomas rushed into the yard. Oi! Those are my coaches, he shouted. Give them back! Don't be rude, Thomas, Annie said sternly. Garrett here needs our help. We're showing him how to pull coaches smoothly, explained Clarabelle. If he can't by tomorrow, the rail tour manager will replace him. Thomas looked at Garrett. He didn't want him to be replaced either. Oh, all right, he said, as long as you're careful with them. I will, said Garrett, I promise. Garrett was soon off and away down the line with Annie and Clara. At first, things were fine as he slowly trundled along. Try going a bit faster, dearie, said Annie. So, Garrett went faster, but he soon started to feel nervous again. He didn't want to hurt Annie and Clarabelle. It was too late, though. The coaches bumped and battled behind him. Oh no, Garrett! Too rough, Garrett! The coaches wailed. Slow down, Garrett! Slow down! Garrett slowed to a stop. The coaches were gravely shaken. You can't get nervous like that when you're pulling coaches, panted Annie. Oh no, Garrett sighed. I seem to do well when I go slow, but I end up getting nervous when I go faster. Let's try again, sighed Clarabelle. But remember, don't get too nervous. So they tried again. But no matter how hard he tried, he kept getting nervous and bumped and jittered the coaches all the way back to Napoli. Annie and Clarabelle were exhausted. Garrett, fumed Thomas, you said you'd take care of them. I tried, Thomas, I really did, Garrett pleaded. He just gets so nervous, moaned Annie and Clarabelle together. I suppose there's no use, Garrett sighed. The rail tour manager will have another engine pull the train home. Garrett sat in the yard, feeling very sorry for himself. If only I didn't get so nervous when I pulled coaches, he thought to himself. I've never had this issue with goods. Then, Donald pulled in the long, heavy goods train. He looked very puffed out. He then noticed Garrett. Oi, you! shouted Donald. Garrett looked up. Me? he asked. Aye, said Donald. And as a wheel man, I cannot go no further with these pesky trucks. Then do for the docks. Please help if you can. Don't worry, said Garrett. I'll help. Garrett was soon coupled up to Donald, and together they rolled away with the long line of trucks. Garrett, being very experienced with heavy goods trains, made easy goings of it as he took the strain of the trucks.
Donald was very impressed. Soon the train arrive at the docks. Thank you, Garrett, said Donald, who was most grateful for the help. That's all right, said Garrett, between heavy pants. I must add, you make smooth goings with those trucks, added Donald. Probably the smoothest run I've ever seen. Garrett suddenly realised. Of course, he cheered. Now I know how to pull coaches. And he raced away, leaving Donald wondering what coaches had to do with goods trains. Annie, Clarabelle, Garrett called out, thankful to find them up the line with Thomas. I figured it out. All I have to do is pretend coaches are goods trains. What do you mean? asked the coaches. I helped Donald with a goods train, he explained, and I didn't get nervous once. I'd like to try it with you. Please? I'm not so sure, said Thomas. Oh, please, pleaded Garrett. It'll just be once more. All right, Thomas said cautiously, but no more after this. So Garrett was coupled to Annie and Clarabelle. The coaches braced themselves. But to their surprise, there was no bumping or jittering, even when Garrett ran quickly down the line. It was smooth all the way through. They didn't stop until they pulled into Napford. The rail tour manager was surprised to see Garrett pulling coaches and that they weren't being bumped about. Garrett, he said, how ever are you doing this? I just imagine the coaches are trucks, Garrett explained. I'm not nervous when I pull them. Well, said the rail tour manager, sounding very impressed. If you're able to be smooth with these coaches, then I don't see why you can't take the rail to a train home. Hooray! cheered Annie and Clarabelle. Well done, Garrett! <whistles> yes, yes, that's all well and good, huffed Thomas finally pulling up. Now give me back my coaches! International Rail Tour had just arrived at Knapford. The large green engine pulling the train had come all the way from Australia. Later, Percy arrived with some coal trucks when he noticed the newcomer. Wait a minute, he said to himself, that engine looks familiar. The engine reminded him of Bruce, the Australian engine who visited last year and tricked Percy into saying bad words. Oh no, he said. I'm not going to let this one trick me too. Come on, Percy, said his driver. So you've had one bad experience. You can't let that stop you from meeting new engines. Not if I can help it, Percy huffed. But just as Percy was about to leave, the engine spoke to him. Hello there, she said. You're Percy, right? I am, he replied, sounding a little surprised. How do you know my name? My brother told me about you, she said. I'm New South Wales Government Railways 3801. Percy smiled. So you're Bruce's sister, right? That's right. He told me he got you into a little bit of trouble. He did, Percy huffed angrily. Don't worry, 3801 said. I gave him an earful when he came back to the facility. I told him, whatever were you thinking, 3806? I told you, Sheila, he said. Call me Bruce. Don't use that bogan talk with me. We're here to proudly represent our country, and you had to go and start all that. 
I learned me lesson, didn't I? I won't say bad words again. You better not, I said. You're an express engine and should know better. Yeah, all right, he finished. Percy laughed. That sounds like him, all right, he said. Hopefully some of the other engines here are just as understanding as you are, 3801 said. Of course they'll be. Percy was right. 3801 met with the other engines and they all got along well together. You've all been so welcoming and understanding, 3801 said later that day. You haven't met Gordon yet, said Henry. He's an express engine too. One of them anyway, James boasted. I've been known to pull the express from time to time. Some would argue even better than Gordon. Funny, Henry remarked. I could have sworn they said the same thing about me too. James grumbled to himself. Just then, Gordon puffed into the yard. What's this? he asked. Has that Australian engine come back to cause more trouble? You're thinking of my brother, 3801 responded. I'm his sister. Gordon frowned. Then I suppose I'd expect the same from you. Don't be silly, Gordon, Percy huffed. She's not like that. But Gordon wouldn't listen. I'm not convinced, he huffed. If you've known one engine like that, you can be sure they'll all be the same. And he puffed away, wishing rudely at 3801. Goodness me, she remarked. What a horrid engine. I'm sorry, 3801, Percy sympathised. Gordon can be stubborn at times. That's one way to put it, chortled James. The next day, Gordon was rushing to nap at the express. Hurry, 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 he sang to the coaches. But there was trouble ahead. At the level crossing, a lorry had become unhitched from its trailer while crossing the line, and the driver was trying to quickly reattach it. Gordon saw the lorry as he came near to the crossing. Out of my way! He whispered. Express coming through! The station master waved and shouted for Gordon to stop. Gordon's driver applied the brakes, and Gordon squealed through the station and stopped at the level crossing gates. Just in time. As the lorry was reattached to the trailer and was on its way, Gordon's driver and fireman were looking him over before they started again. You damaged your brakes when you stopped so quickly, the driver said. You can't pull the train like this. We'll have to telephone for help. Oh dear, thought Gordon. What a shame it is. Soon, the driver came back to say that help was coming. Gordon was relieved, but he was surprised to see that 3801 had come to help. Hello, Gordon, she said, pulling up alongside the big engine. Heard you damaged your brakes after some heroics. Gordon didn't say anything. He was too embarrassed about what he said to her yesterday. Luckily, I was at the station ready to take my rail to a train home when they told me, 3801 continued. She was just about to couple up to Gordon, but then stopped. On second thought, she said, I probably shouldn't help you and just leave you and your passengers here. It makes sense since, you know, we Australian engines just love causing trouble. Gordon was flustered. Wait, I, um... It's like you said, if you've known one engine like that, you can be sure they'll all be the same. All right, pleaded Gordon. I'm sorry for what I said. Can you please help me? The passengers mustn't be late. The fat controller will be cross. 3801 thought for a moment. Oh, all right, she said. Let's get this train moving. Soon, 3801 was coupled up to Gordon. The guard blew his whistle and the two big engines pulled the coaches all the way to Napoli.
Gordon was impressed. Soon, 3801 was coupled to the rail to a train. Gordon and Percy had come to see her off. Thank you for helping me, Gordon said thoughtfully. I'm sorry for thinking you were troublesome. It's all right, 3801 said. We express engines must stick together after all. See, Gordon? Percy remarked. You mustn't let one bad experience ruin your outlook. Then the guard's whistle blew, and 3801 steamed away. The calmness of the morning was soon interrupted by the sounds of grumbling and complaining as the new rail to a train pulled into the station. The two old fashioned looking engines were relieved. Finally! said the rear engine. You can stop pulling my coupler. I wasn't pulling you, said the front one. You were just going too slow. I ain't slow. You are too, yo galoot. That's fine coming from you, you lousy tin can. Just then, Toby arrived with Henrietta. Bless my bell, he stated. What's all this arguing about? I was about to ask the same thing, said Duck who came over from the opposite direction. See what you did, said the rear engine. You went and caused a scene. You're the one who started it, the front engine huffed. All right, all right, called Toby, ringing his bell for silence. Now, obviously, you're here for a rail tour. What's your names? I'm Union Pacific 119, said the rear engine. And that up there, I can introduce myself, you varmint. I'm Central Pacific Jupiter. I recognize those names, said Duck. You two were part of the first transcontinental railroad in America. You yeah, got that right, sonny boy, said 119 proudly. We were the first locomotives to meet together in Promontory, Utah, said Jupiter, to help build a railroad that connected all 37 United States. But why are you arguing so much? asked Toby. Oh, it started back when we were doing them annual reenactments, said Jupiter. We try to get every detail right every time we do it. Then one year, when they was a reenacting the photograph being taken, said 119, the feller who was playing Elias Johnson was supposed to be standing next to me. I keep telling you, you oversized spittoon, Jupiter interrupted. He was always next to me. No, he wasn't. Yes, he was. All right, we get it, called Duck. So you've had a disagreement in the past, but... Oh, it's more than just a disagreement, huffed 119. We worked together and known each other for so long that we plain up can't stand each other anymore. You're dang right, huffed Jupiter. Besides the reenactments, the only time we speak to each other is when we're a feudin'. That's probably the only thing we can agree on. Toby and Duck could see that both engines were stubborn and set in their ways. Later, Duck was arranging stone trucks at the quarry when Toby arrived to drop off more workmen. I wish there was some way we could get Jupiter and 119 to stop arguing, said Duck. I know, put in Toby. Listening to them arguing is exhausting. Toby looked over and watched as Duck loaded the trucks. He saw that he was pushing them along as they were being loaded. That's a strange way to load trucks, wouldn't you say? said Toby. What do you mean? asked Duck. 
I always push my trucks until the one nearest me is under the hopper. Then I pull them out as they're loading. I've always pushed in empties and brought them out when they're filled. I don't see why he'd bother doing that, remarked Toby. I find my ways to be a tad quicker. I uh, beg pardon, said Duck dryly, but that's how I managed on the Great Western. Oh, stop fussing, boys, said Henrietta. It doesn't matter how you load the trucks. All that matters is that they get loaded at all. The two engines stopped for a moment. I suppose you're right, Henrietta, said Toby. Getting the work done and being really useful is most important. Indeed it is, agreed Duck. Then an idea flew into his funnel. That's it. What's it? asked Toby. I found out how we can get 119 and Jupiter to get along again. Meet me at Knapford. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jupiter and 119 continued their arguing. The other engines sulked when they had to pass by their shed. I keep telling you, you rambling wreck, argued 119. Jensen was standing next to me when the picture was taken. And I says he was next to me, you overgrown kettle, Jupiter argued back. You're full of sarsaparilla, you old coot. You're as crooked as a dog's hind leg. Just then, Duck and Toby puffed into the yard. All right, you two, Duck announced. We're going to put an end to all this once and for all. I don't reckon you can solve this problem, said Jupiter. We've been a feudant for over a hundred years, said 119. Perhaps, insisted Duck, but we'll give it a go. Now, said Toby, this all started because you forgot where someone was standing. Right, said the two old engines. And every year during a reenactment, this disagreement always manages to come up. Right, then that settles it, finished Toby. The reenactment's been ruined. Well, that ain't true now, objected 119. Everything else always goes perfectly every year we do it. That's right, added Jupiter. Even if we have the old complaint, we still manage to entertain everyone that comes to see us. Even if you don't know where Elias Jansen was standing, asked Duck. Yep, both engines said in unison. Suddenly, the realization came to them. So I guess our feuding didn't really matter at all, said 119. We managed to do our job without knowing every minute detail. And if that's the only important thing, said Jupiter, then I reckon we've been useful all along. Toby and Duck were glad to see that they were able to solve their feud. Then, the rail tour manager walked up to Jupiter and 119. There you are. He said, I managed to find some information about the photo from 1869, and it turns out Elias Jensen was standing next to you, Jupiter, just out of shot. Jupiter whistled cheerfully. I knew it! I knew it! He shouted. I told you he was next to me, you chicken-eating corn boy! Now you're dead, you honey-glazed fruitcake, cabbage nose skin peeler, rusted out grease trap! Toby and Duck sighed. I suppose old habits die hard, said Duck. It would appear so, said Toby. The Sodo Ironworks, also known as the Scrapyards, is a very important location on the island. Whenever old things cannot be useful anymore, they are taken away to the scrapyards to be cut up and melted down, where they then can be made into new things. The engines are often scared to go there. While the Fat Controller has made it clear to them that they will always have a home on his railway, 
they can't help but feel a bit nervous when they are sent to work there, especially since the two ironworks diesels, Harry and Bert, like to play tricks on them. One morning, a new rail to a train pulled into Napford Station. Its engine was named Evening Star. Murdoch came to see her. Murdoch? Evening Star called. She could hardly believe her eyes. Is that you, brother? Yes, it is, Murdoch replied. It's good to see you again. Oh, yes, it is such a beautiful experience to see one of my brothers or sisters again, Evening Star wistfully sighed. Especially nowadays. There aren't many of us left, after all. Murdoch silently agreed. Then, the Fat Controller came to see Evening Star. There's been a change in your accommodations, he said. Normally, the sheds at the end of the yard would be reserved for your use, but it's currently being repainted. The only place that has space for you is the scrapyards. Thank you for letting me know, sir, Evening Star smiled. Murdoch made a face. Are you sure you wouldn't want to sleep anywhere else, he said. I'm sure I can find space at my shed. No need to worry, Murdoch, Evening Star said. I'm sure that I'll be comfortable there. When night time came, Evening Star made her way to the scrapyards. She looked around nervously as the looming hulks of dead engines and machinery flanked her from either side. The sound of rusting metal and the hum of the smelting shed filled the air. Then, Harry and Bert pulled towards her. They thought it fun to try to scare her. The fat controller told us you'd be coming here tonight, Harry growled. I'd be careful, Bert grunted. You wouldn't want to end up like this sorry lot. He glanced over to an engine's boiler. I'll be okay, Evening Star said quietly. Thank you for letting me stay here. Harry and Bert looked at each other confused. No steam engine was ever thankful to be at the scrapyards. Evening Star then pulled into the siding and fell asleep. The next morning, Evening Star was wide awake and cheerful. Harry and Bert was still determined to get a fright out of her. Good morning, said Evening Star cheerfully. What's so good about it? Bert roared. You're a steamy in the scrapyard, said Harry. You should be terrified. Evening Star thought for a moment. I was at first, she admitted. But when I look around these scrapped engines, all I see is how they can be useful later on. Eh? You see, I know that they're going to be cut up and melted down, but their metal will be used to create new things, like a car, or a bus, or an aeroplane, or even a new kind of engine. So, in a sense, they'll never stop being really useful. Evening Star puffed out of the scrapyard. I'll see you later, she called. Harry and Bert stared. What is she on about? asked Harry. No steam engine's ever been happy to stay here before, replied Bert. We'll have to try harder, Harry decided. We'll make you crack. Just you wait and see. Later on, Bert was collecting trucks of scrap when he noticed Evening Star up the line. He stopped when he came near her. What are you doing here? he grunted. Shh, she said quietly. Look over there, near the trees. Bert looked closer. I can't see anything, he said. Look closer. Bert looked again. Then he saw it. It was a mother deer with a baby near her feet. Isn't nature simply wonderful? whispered Evening Star. I, um, suppose so. Bert pondered. Life is a gift that we should never take for granted, Evening Star went on. For it's as fragile as that newborn deer. Look how the mother cares for it. That's how we should treat all life. Like a baby deer? Yes, 
like a baby deer. Bert was quiet for a moment. I'm sorry for trying to frighten you yesterday, he said at last. It's quite all right, said Evening Star. You should probably be on your way with those trucks. I'm sure Airy is waiting for you. Oh, yeah, right, spluttered Bert, and went on his way. Airy was waiting impatiently as Bert pulled into the scrapyard. There you are, he grumbled. Where have you been? Uh, sorry, Harry, replied Bert. I was on my way back when... Never mind. Now, listen here. I've just thought of something that'll scare Evening Star out of her buffers. Um, Harry, said Bert. I don't think I want to do that anymore. Harry frowned. Don't tell me you've gone soft. I'm just saying, maybe we could be nice to the steam engines for a change, Bert suggested. Show them we ain't so bad after all. Harry was furious. Right, that's told it, he growled. I'm going to bring her down to reality if it's the last thing I do. Harry rushed out of the scrapyard. Wait, don't, Bert called out and raced after him. At Knapford Station, Evening Star was preparing to take her rail to a train back to the mainland. Murdoch had come to say goodbye. There wasn't much trouble at the scrapyard, was there? asked Murdoch. Not necessarily, said Evening Star. Those two diesels you mentioned did try to scare me, but I remain undeterred. You know, some may not see it, but I do think they have good in them. Oh, Evening Star. You always see the good in people, said Murdoch admiringly. Just then, Harry raced up to her, with Bert trailing behind. Listen here, you, Harry grumbled. What is it with you? What do you mean? asked Evening Star innocently. This unrealistic, flowery, sappy personality of yours, Harry continued. You go about pretending that the world is some big, happy wonderland of pleasures, when it obviously isn't. Honestly, who thinks like that? You should be the most miserable engine in the world, because, may I remind you, you're the last steam engine built on the mainland. If I were you, I'd be miserable. So what gives? The station fell silent. Murdoch was so cross, he wanted to give Airy a piece of his mind. But Evening Star broke the silence. You're correct, she said. I am the last steam engine built for British Railways. My existence marks the end of an era, and I have felt this burden for years. Yes, I was miserable, but one day I decided that, even though my story has a sad beginning, I won't let that dissuade me from living to the fullest and to never take anything for granted. But I... you... Harry was struggling to find the right words to say. Never mind, Harry, said Bert. Let's go home. The two diesel shunters rolled away to the scrapyard as Evening Star pulled her train out of the station. Harry was silent for the rest of the day. He had a lot to think about. the western engine was in a rush. Come along, Toad, he puffed. The rail tour is coming today. I'm right behind you, Mr. Oliver, Toad clattered behind. They had just stopped into Napton when the rail to a train glided in beside them. The 
engine looked at Oliver. Hello, he said. You're Great Western, aren't you? That's right, I'm Oliver. This here's my brake vent toad. Hello. Nice to meet you, the visitor said. I am Lord Star. Oh, Lordy, called a voice. A lady had run from the coaches all the way up to Lone Star. Oh, that was a lovely run, my darling, the lady exclaimed. Simply the best from the best engine I know. Linda, not now, said Lone Star. He felt rather awkward. Who's this? Oliver replied. Oh, um, Lone Star was trying to find the right words. I'm Linda, said the woman. I help look after him. She's just a volunteer for my preservation trust, Lodestar bluntly added. Oh, I'm more than just a volunteer, Linda smirked. You could say that Lodestar and I are, well, simply meant to be. Olive and Toad stared in confusion. Ahem, Lodestar butted in. Uh, perhaps we should let Olive and Toad go on with their work. Um, all right, Oliver stuttered. We can talk Great Western later. Goodbye. That lady seems to like Mr. Lone Star an awful lot, Mr. Oliver, Toad said later that day. She sure does, added Oliver. Perhaps a tad too much, if you ask me. Much more than a volunteer should. But our railway has some volunteers, Mr. Oliver, Toad added, and they say they love doing it. Why would Miss Linda be any different? It's, um, complicated, Oliver explained, but I think we should keep an eye out for Lodestar. That night, Lodestar sat nervously in the shed when Oliver came to see him. Thank goodness you've come, he said. You didn't see her, did you? No, I haven't, said Oliver. That's lucky, Lodestar sighed. He looked around, then whispered. That lady's completely mad. Oliver and Toad listened. It all started normal enough, he explained. Just another volunteer at the trust. She did a good enough job. The lads didn't mind a bird in their ranks, so they kept her on. Worked her way up in the system, even managed my footplate a few times. Later on though, she began staying late after hours. We'd just talk, nothing too serious. Then she'd start going on about emotional connections between lovers. At first, I thought she was smitten with one of the lads. Come to find out, she was talking about me. It's not natural, man falling in love with machine. I told management about it. She was demoted down to cleaner, better than nothing I suppose. When I was chosen for the Branco Rail Tours, I was relieved, thought I'd be rid of her for a few months. Then she goes and buys a ticket for every leg of my journey. Have you told the Rail Tour manager? asked Oliver. I have, Lodestar continued. He told me he can't bar her from my trains unless she tries anything stupid. Who knows how long that would be? Oh, Lodi, my love. It was Linda who had just snuck up to them. Linda! Lodestar exclaimed. What are you doing here? This is railway property, added Oliver. It's not safe for people to be out here without authorised permission. Never mind! Linda snarled. She turned to Lodestar. My darling, she said. I can't contain my feelings any longer. I love you. I want to spend my life with you. I don't care what anyone else says. We're simply meant to be. No, we aren't! Lodestar shouted. Can't you see? This isn't normal. Love is blind, Linda cried. If anyone opposes, let them speak now or forever hold their peace. We object. The fat controller and the rail tour manager came out from behind the shed doors and spoke to her severely. Linda, you have taken this too far, the rail tour manager stated. You are officially barred from the train back to the mainland. And should you decide to step foot on railway property again, the Fat Controller added, I will inform the police. Linda was then led away by workmen. Lodestar was relieved. Thank you, sirs, he said. I guess we won't have to worry about her anymore, Oliver said. Quite right, Mr. Oliver, remarked Toad. The next day, Lodestar happily waited to take his rail to a train. 
He was relieved that he didn't have to worry about Linda showing up again. Suddenly, he felt a hand on his regulator. He slowly began to move forward. That's strange, he thought. I didn't hear a guard whistle. He called to his driver. What's going on? Why are we moving? If I can't win you with my love, then I shall take you! Lodestar gasped in horror to discover that Linda was at his controls. Help! Help! He whistled as he puffed along the line, leaving his train and crew behind. Lone Star thundered along the rails. He raced to a station where Olive and Toad were waiting with a goods train. It's Miss Linda, Mr. Oliver! exclaimed Toad. I saw her in his cab! Oliver's driver ran to the signal box to warn the signalman of the runaway. Meanwhile, Lodestar kept speeding down the line. Linda! he pleaded. You have to stop! Never! she cried from a cab. Lodestar looked further down the line and saw a set of points that were against them. We're going to crash! he shouted and shut his eyes. Lodestar came off the line with a terrific jolt and came to rest on the grass. Lodi! Linda called out. Are you all right, my love? Stop it! Lodestar shouted. I am not your love, and I never will be. That was completely stupid what you've done. You could have been killed. But I did this for us, Linda pleaded. I only want what's best for you. Is this what's best for me? Linda stopped and stared at the engine. You are unwell, Lodestar went on. You are a human! I am a locomotive! You cannot keep obsessing over this! This isn't normal! You need help! Linda stared at the wreckage she caused. It finally became clear to her. She collapsed and began to weep. Yes, you're right, she said between sobs. I'm not okay. I need help. Oliver brought the breakdown train to the scene of the crash. Lodestar was soon put back on the rails. Linda was swiftly apprehended by police and taken away by ambulance to hospital. I suppose we won't be seeing her for a long time, the rail tour manager remarked. I only regret that we didn't act sooner before all this happened. Sir, asked Lodestar, the doctors will help Linda, won't they? Why, certainly they will, the rail tour manager assured. I'd argue that you helped her a tremendous deal yourself. How's that? You were able to convince her that she needed to reach out, the rail tour manager explained. You know what they say, the first step in solving a problem is admitting that there is one. Lodestar could only agree. Trevor is an old traction engine who lives and works at the vicarage orchard. When he isn't busy, he likes to watch the engines go rushing by, especially his friend Edward, who had saved him from scrap. Trevor is always grateful for this, but he hasn't found a proper way to return this favour. Edward was shunting in the yard when a new rail tour engine glided into the station. He went over to say hello. Hello, he said cheerfully. I'm Edward, who are you? The large engine softly spoke. Greetings, he said. 
I am Tie Gong Niao. Tie Gong Niao, Edward repeated. What an interesting name. Oh, yes, the engine flustered. I should explain. I have come from China as part of a rail tour. That is how it is said in my language. You can call me Iron Bull. Very well, Iron Bull, said Edward. Tell me, what are the railways in China like? So Iron Bull told Edward all about his railway and the engines that worked there. Later that day, Trevor was resting happily in the sunshine when Edward came to see him. We've got a new rail tour today, he said. The engine's called Iron Bull, and he's come all the way from China. How exciting, peeped Trevor. I hope I get to meet him. Just then, the vicar walked over. Come along, Trevor, he said. Farmer Finney says he needs you to thresh some grain for his chickens. His farm's quite near the station, Edward added. Perhaps you'll be able to meet him after all. That could be arranged, said the vicar. Soon, Trevor, Edward and Iron Bull were talking together like old friends. Iron Bull was very intrigued by Trevor. Being a traction engine, Trevor explained, I still use coal and water, but I run on roads instead of rails. Iron Bull smiled. What a miraculous engine you are, he said. Though, I wouldn't be where I am today without Edward, said Trevor. He saved me from scrap, you know. Iron Bull paused and looked at Edward. Is this so? he asked. Yes, it is. Luckily, I was able to find the vicar who gave Trevor a home in the vicarage orchard. I still need to properly repay you for saving me, Trevor added. Edward laughed. I've told you, think nothing of it. Your gratitude is repayment enough. Iron Bull thought for a moment. Perhaps he could find a home for me too. What was that? asked Edward. Oh, nothing, nothing, Iron Bull flustered. And not to worry at all. Trevor wasn't convinced. That afternoon, Trevor had returned from threshing grain for Farmer Finney. As the sun quietly set over the island, he couldn't help but think about what Iron Bull had said. What did he mean by find a home for him? He wondered. Could he not have a home in China? Trevor, there you are, called a voice. It was Iron Bull, puffing towards the fence. I was hoping I would find you here. What did you mean when you said that you hoped the vicar could find a home for you? Trevor asked. Iron Bull sighed. Unfortunately, I have not told you my whole story, he said. I was truthful with you until a point, but perhaps I should tell you. Trevor listened. My railway is heavily controlled by the government, he began. They have allowed steam engines to work in tandem with diesels and electric engines for a long period of time. But now they have decided that the use of steam engines would not be in the best interest of China's global image and have begun to phase out steam engines from mainline service. When I was chosen to be part of the Branco Rail Tours, I was told that I was essentially given up as a donation, with no intention to be sent back. However, should I return to China once my rail tour is complete, it is certain that I will be scrapped. Trevor didn't know what to say. He had felt the hopeless fear of being scrapped before, but he had Edward in the vicar to save him but it looked as though Iron Bull had no one to come to his rescue at all. I wish I knew how to help you, he said sadly. The next day, Trevor spoke to the vicar about Iron Bull's dilemma. And he says that if he goes back to China, he'll be scrapped, he finished. I understand your concern, said the vicar, but I doubt that we can do anything to help. I suppose you wouldn't have space for a large engine like him, would you? Trevor asked innocently. Don't be silly, Trevor, the vicar frowned. Whilst I've sworn my life to do the Lord's work upon creation, there is only so much a mortal man can do. Besides, your case was much simpler. Trevor looked down sadly. But perhaps, the vicar pondered, 
I could have a word with the rail tour manager. As if by chance, Edward came up excitedly. The rail tour manager was in his cab. You must be Trevor then, said the rail tour manager. He tipped his hat to the vicar. How do you do, sir? Whatever is all this? Trevor asked. You must come to Napford, Edward said excitedly. I'll explain on the way. Iron Bull sat in his siding. His rail to a train was due to leave later that day. He was forlorn about it, for it would mean the possibility of going back to China to be scrapped. Edward suddenly pulled into the yard with the vicar, the rail to a manager, and Trevor loaded onto a truck. Goodness me, Iron Bull gasped. What is all this for? Iron Bull? said the rail tour manager. I know that you were concerned about what would happen once your rail tour was complete, but... I understand, sir, Iron Bull sadly interrupted. I will accept my eminent fate. Good, the rail tour manager said, because you won't be going back to China. Iron Bull was confused. What do you mean? I was waiting to tell you before it was officially confirmed, the rail tour manager continued. You're not going to be scrapped. You're going to be sent to work on a railway in America, added Edward. In a place called Iowa, Trevor chirped. I'm not too sure where that is, though, but you won't have to worry about scrap anymore. You hear that, Iron Bull? said the vicar. The rail to a manager saved you. Iron Bull was overjoyed. What wonderful news this is! I have been given a second chance! And Iron Bull blew his whistle as loud as he could. Edward and Trevor joined in. Well, Trevor, said Edward, I suppose you could say that you paid it forward. Eh, what do you mean? Well, explained Edward, you wanted to find a way to repay me for saving you from scrap. But you've paid it forward by helping Iron Bull. Oh, I get it now, said Trevor excitedly. I suppose we're even then. Exactly, smiled Edward. And for that, Iron Bull finished, I am grateful. Daisy is a diesel rail car that thinks very highly of herself. Every day she swanks up and down the line, boasting how she's highly sprung and bang up to date. This boasting often annoys the other engines. One morning, Daisy was taking on more diesel fuel at Knapford. James pulled up beside her. You know, James, she began, it does get rather tiresome being so splendid all the time. You barely have enough time for yourself. Fishing for compliments again, James sniffed. I'd be careful. Some would say that's a bad habit. Ha! Daisy snorted. Like you're one to talk, always going on about your paintwork. Meanwhile, I have something to brag about. I'm the latest up-to-date Diesel. Give or take 30 years, James smirked. Just then, the two engines saw a new rail to the train pulled into the station. James and Daisy were amazed. The engine was painted bright orange with silver letters and trim, which glistened in the sunlight. Who is that? Daisy wondered. Obviously she's here for a rail tour, James whispered. I know that, grumbled Daisy. Well, are you two going to just sit there gawking at me from behind, or are you going to come up here for a better view? 
The engines jumped. They didn't realize the engine was watching them. They went up to say hello. Sorry about that. I'm James. And I'm Daisy. Charmed, I'm sure, the engine said slyly. I'm Southern Pacific 4449. My public calls me daylight, after the train I used to pull. We were just admiring your lovely paintwork, Daisy added. Oh, that's no surprise, darling, Daylight scoffed. I turn heads wherever I go. It doesn't matter what I'm doing or where I go. There's always someone who wants to shine in the brilliance of daylight. She was right. The passengers had soon gathered around to marvel at her. Even the station staff went to take a look. James and Daisy were impressed and a little bit jealous. Later that day, Daisy had stopped at a station when Ryan pulled up with some trucks. Daisy, said Ryan, have you seen that new rail to engine Daylight? She's a beauty. I have, huffed Daisy, feeling rather offended. What's the matter, Daisy? I'm worried, Ryan, said Daisy. She's unlike any engine I've ever seen. Why, everyone will soon be more interested in seeing her than me. She'll only be here for a few days, said Ryan. It's not like she's going to live here from now on. Don't even put that thought into my head, Daisy winced. Ooh, I'm simply green with envy. But aren't you already green? Daisy sighed. I just hope James isn't feeling too discouraged. Meanwhile, James had arrived at Nap with some coaches. He slid into the station. Here's James, he announced gladly. But there was no one there to greet him. Usually, the passengers would look and admire him. But everyone seemed to have their attention on daylight. James went as red as his coat. That does it, he fumed. He stormed over to daylight. Now listen here, you, you, you. Oh, honey, you can call me whatever you like. I can tolerate many things on this railway, James huffed. But when it comes to taking my passengers away from my splendidness, that's where I draw the line. Daylight stared. Is it really not obvious to you? She said. You shouldn't be surprised that they'd leave you. I mean, look at you. You're a relic compared to me. James stammered. A, a, a relic? Remember what I said, baby. Everyone wants to shine in the brilliance of daylight. James was so cross that his safety valve nearly burst. He huffed away, muttering under his breath. That night in the sheds, both James and Daisy complained to the others. That daylight is so full of herself, James seethed. Who does she think she is, calling me a relic? And taking our passengers, added Daisy. It's as if they've forgotten we existed. And she's always talking about how shining and splendid she is, agreed James. How could anyone tolerate having such an engine on their railway? The other engines silently agreed that the irony was lost on them. The next day, daylight was simmering happily in the yard as her rail to a train was being prepared. She was suddenly interrupted by a line of coal trucks bumping into her. Ouch! she exclaimed. Sorry, said Devil. I didn't see you. Move these out of my way, Daylight huffed. They're blocking my view. I would, Neville said, but I'm needed at the quarry for an urgent load. Goodbye. And Neville trundled away happily. Daylight seethed. Come along, Daylight, said a driver. Let's get you coupled up. But what about these filthy trucks? Daylight protested. I can't get my coaches with them in the way. We'll just have to move them then. Daylight was furious. What do I look like, a freight engine? I am not touching these trucks. It was nearly time for the rail to a train to head off. The passengers began to complain. They thought Daylight would never move. Just then, Daisy pulled up. Daylight, she said. 
isn't your train due out soon? You shouldn't keep your passengers waiting. I would be off and on my way, darling, huffed Daylight. But I simply refuse to touch these disgusting trucks. Oh, come now, Daisy insisted. That won't do at all. But I suppose if you won't move these trucks, I will. So Daisy buffered up to the trucks and pulled them away. Passengers cheered. See, she remarked, it isn't as hard as it looks. Daylight said nothing and slunk out of the siding. Later that day, Daisy told James everything that happened. Well, I suppose the rail tour manager will have some unpleasant words for her, he laughed. Being splendid all the time is all well and good, Daisy added, but being a really useful engine is what's most important. Quite agreed, remarked James. Thomas the Tank Engine had just arrived at Lamford with Annie and Clarabelle when the last rail to a train of the summer pulled into the station. Hello, said Thomas cheerfully. Hey there, partner, said the engine. I'm Union Pacific 844. Welcome to Sodor 844. I'm... Wait a second, said 844, eyeing Thomas up and down. Are you Thomas the Tank Engine? Um, yes, Thomas replied, quite surprised that the visitor already knew who he was. I knew it! I knew it! 844 cheered. I knew I'd run into you on this here island. You even matched the description perfectly. Thomas was confused. What are you talking about? 844 collected himself. Well, y'all ain't gonna believe this, he said, but back in the States, I was doing an excursion on the Indian Valley Railroad. There was a station on that line, I forget the name of it, but there were some children that spent their free time just watching trains come and go. Anyway, for some reason, they told me if I should ever find myself on the island of Sodor to say hello to a little blue tank engine named Thomas. Thomas was perplexed. I don't know any American children, he said, and I've never even been there. How can someone know who I am without ever meeting me? You got me there, partner. Are you sure you're not having me on? Oh, no, not at all, 844 assured. I'll tell you, as sure as my Mars light is red, I am telling you the honest-to-goodness truth. Eight forty four was soon uncoupled from his coaches and backed carefully into a siding. All the while, he was still wondering how those children knew of Thomas. There's got to be some explanation, he thought to himself. But he was tired after his long journey. <laughs> Maybe I'll remember it tomorrow, he yawned. And eight forty four fell fast asleep. Look, look at the dog over there. Look, over there. Hey, wake up. Look at the dog. Wake up. <laughs> 844 woke with a start to see that a man with a blue uniform was looking at him. <laughs> what happened? He asked sleepily. Well, for one thing, you completely missed the dog, said the man. 
You see one dog, you've seen them all, 844 grumbled, rather annoyed that he was woken up. He stared at the man. Who are you anyway? I suppose you could say I'm a friend, the man happily replied. Well, friends shouldn't wake other friends up to look at dogs. The man pondered for a moment. Hold on a minute, he said. You're Union Pacific 844, aren't you? That I am, mister, 844 said, feeling more awake now. I thought I recognized you, the man went on. I saw you when you visited the Indian Valley Railroad back in 89. I remember that. I reckon you all work there. I live there, the man said, in a mural at one of the stations. 844 stared. You live in a painting? Yes, but enough about me. Let's talk about you. How do you end up all the way out here? Pretty far from Union Pacific's locale. I was shipped here for the Branco Rail Tours they're doing all over Britain, 844 explained. This station here on the island of Sodor is one of the stops. You must have met my friend Thomas the Tank Engine, said the man. 844 stared. How do you know Thomas? We go way back, the man said. Had lots of adventures. Sometimes I tell stories about him to the children when they come to play at my station. So you're the one that told them? 844 was surprised. That's right, the man replied. I hope you can visit the station again. I'd like to, 844 began, but I can't for the life of me remember the name. Don't worry, the man reassured. It'll come to you eventually. There's a shine to it. You'll remember in time. 844 thought for a moment. A shine to it. Remember in time. Shine time. Shining Time, he shouted. That was the name of the station. Shining Time Station. Thanks, Mr. But as 844 looked towards the man, he was nowhere to be seen. Wait, where go? The next day, 844 waited in Knapford to take his rail to a train back to the mainland. Thomas had come to see him off. Thomas, 844 said. It was Shining Time. That's the station I was at. Uh, what do you mean? asked Thomas. There's this man, 844 began. He talked with me yesterday. He was dressed up like a conductor, or a guard in your case. He says that he knows you and tells the children stories about you and your adventures. Thomas was even more confused. Now I know you're definitely having me on. No, I swear, 844 pleaded, as sure as my Mars light is red. That's why the children knew about you and told me to meet you. Thomas smiled. Well, if you do go to Shining Time Station and see those children and find this Mr. Conductor, he said, be sure to say that Thomas says hello. I sure will, 844 said. Then the gong's whistle blew. 844 started for the mainland. See you around, partner. Thomas laughed to himself. <laughs> Mr. Conductor, <laughs> really now? Reach for the speed, reach for the whistle, go where the rail may run. Reach for the words, reach for the story, follow the rainbow sun. To a shining time station, where dreams can come true, waiting there for you. So far to travel, so much to learn to know Friends by your side, hopes to hold on to Who knows how far you'll go To a shining time station Where dreams can come true Your own imagination waiting there for you
Iron Bull had just been shunted into the locomotive facility. We'll keep you here for a few weeks, said a workman. We'll run some tests on you to make sure you're in fine condition to be sent home. Oh, but I won't be going back to China, Iron Bull smiled. I'm going to live on a railway in Iowa. The workman scoffed. But it's true. I have been arranged to... No worries, I believe you, the workman said. It all depends on if he'll let you out of here. What do you mean? Ahem! Sir Brian Stanley quickly approached the workman. Oh, Sir Stanley, I didn't know you were coming today. Uh, how are you doing? I would like to have a word with you in private. Sir Brian Stanley walked away, with the workman following behind nervously. The other engine shuddered. I thought I had made it extraordinarily clear not to discuss such matters with those engines, Sir Brian Stanley shouted. You are not going to ruin my plans. It, it was a slip-up, sir. O honestly, the workman pleaded. No excuses. Need I remind you that you are under a strict non-disclosure agreement? No one from the outside can know about the true nature of this facility. He paused and composed himself. I will give you one last chance. If it happens again, not only will you be terminated, but Branco will use every legal resource available to sue you for breach of contract. Is that understood? Y yes, sir, the workman whispered nervously. Good, Sir Brian Stanley finished. Now get out of my sight. The workman quickly left the office. I have spent... Too much of my time and energy to have my plans fall through, and so close to completion. As far as I'm concerned, those engines are my property. No matter what any museum or railway or preservation group says. Because no one says no to Brian Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> 